Hello, everyone. At the beginning of the last episode, I asked for your help. I asked if you would please support True Tales from Old Houses by sharing the show on your social media accounts with your friends and family, your local historical society, basically anyone or any organization who would enjoy a show like this one. And then I asked if you would take that one step further by leaving us a five-star rating and a personal review wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you to everyone who took that message to heart. Please keep those five-star and personal reviews coming. Let's work together to get more people involved in old house life and invested in preserving their built environment. Thank you. In today's episode, John Rogers and I disagree during Q&A when a listener asks if she should abandon city life for a big old house in the country. And then later, I chat with Scott Hansen, author of Restoring Your Historic House, The Comprehensive Guide for Homeowners. We talk about his award-winning book and how he introduces modern updates into his 19th century home in Maine. But first, I'm Stacey Grinsfelder from Blake Hill House, and you're listening to True Tales from Old Houses. Welcome back. What a difference two weeks make. Last episode, I was talking about summer, and today I'm wearing a big, fluffy sweater, and I'm fighting off the urge, fighting off the urge to fire up the furnace. The autumn switch has officially been flipped up here in the north. It's probably still warm and sunny where many of you live. Don't tell me because I'll be too jealous. But where I am, we are stocking up on vitamin D supplements and pulling the light therapy lamps out of the closet. If you also struggle with seasonal affective disorder, you know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what a light therapy lamp is. The long nights and gray days start so early around here. Now, before I get into the show, I want to again give a quick shout out to our Season 8 supporters, Sutherland Wells, Preservin, and The Window Course. They keep the lights on here at True Tales from Old Houses, and we are so grateful to have them. This show continues because of their generous support. Okay, I do have some announcements. First, there are still a few tickets left for the Hudson Valley Live Audience event on November 12th. Uh, We did this last year, and this year I'm headed back to record two episodes at Susan and Will Brinson's historic home, Stony Ford. Such a beautiful place. Uh, It's a full-day event. It includes the two shows, plus the house tour of Stony Ford, light food and drink, and post-show social time with everyone there, including my guests, Daniel Cantor, Susan and Will Brinson, Brad Huber from the last episode, and Reggie Young from Hudson Valley House Parts. I haven't met him yet, so I'm quite excited about that. The link to purchase tickets is in the show notes, and I encourage you to buy those tickets quick. The venue's small, and the event will probably sell out. It did last year, so you might want to maybe even think about grabbing the tickets today. Next, I know that I said I was going to have more info about the casual Boston gathering in early December, but I don't quite yet. To bring everyone up to speed, we're going to see the Christmas tree in Boston Common. And if you just started listening to True Tales from Old Houses, for a couple seasons, we had an ongoing conversation about the Halifax explosion of 1917. And to be clear, I am talking about Halifax, Nova Scotia. I know there are several cities in the United States that are also called Halifax, but we're talking Canada here. A quick summary is that right after the explosion, which wiped out a good chunk of the city of Halifax, Boston, Massachusetts sent medical aid and supplies. I think it was in the 1940s that the province of Nova Scotia sent the first Christmas tree to Boston as a thank you gift, but the tradition has been ongoing since 1971. Every year, they light up that Christmas tree in Boston the first weekend in December. So just for fun, we're going to go see the tree, maybe do an informal dinner or drink after, and you are invited, of course. And that's all a bit of a warm-up for the tour that I'm hosting next summer, August 10th through 20th, 2023, where we'll be going to Montreal, Quebec City, and the Canadian Maritimes, including the port city of Halifax. Now, I've been to Halifax before, and it has a very interesting feel with the pre-explosion and post-explosion architecture in two distinct areas. I'm hosting that tour through Holiday Vacations, and you can find out more about the trip and book it through the link that I'll put on the show notes. As I've been preparing for this season and working through it, I realize that there is so much to keep track of. So I did revive the email newsletter to keep everyone up to date between shows. The newsletter, it always includes, or at least I try to always include, a little extra content, maybe a picture or something, about the most recent episode. Then I also add what's coming up, important dates, coupon codes, all that good stuff. To sign up to receive the email newsletter, visit truetalesfromoldhouses.com slash newsletter. So that is it for the travel updates, but I do have one more thing to mention. After a long hiatus, I am finally working on the upstairs 
guest bath remodel again. The guest bath remodel, it was very much a failed contractor project that went from bad to worse. So I put it on the back burner for a while because I just wasn't in the right headspace to tackle it as a DIY. And taking a break was the right call because now I feel ready again. So if you want to follow along with the progress, check out the Blake Hill House blog and real-time updates on my Blake Hill House Instagram account. This will be the third attempt at finishing the bathroom. So hopefully third time's a charm. Listener Q&A is up next. My guest today for Q&A is John Rogers from Phoenix Preservation. Hi, John. Hi, Stacey. How are you doing? I'm good. I feel like I just saw you, which is nice. It is. And, and I just listened to the, the new episode this morning. So it's like we've already been talking. Okay. So I have a question for us to answer today. And I thought you would be a good person to join me for this one because you have some firsthand knowledge, really. You've done this sort of thing before. Little different circumstances. Okay. It's a long question. It might take me a minute to get it out. Okay, I'm ready. All right. Here's the question. I currently live in New York City, and ever since the pandemic shutdown, I've been searching for an old house in the country, dreaming of fixing it up and having land to myself. I think I just found my dream house. It's big, with six bedrooms, two bathrooms, and it's on four acres. The price is amazing, but it does need work, and I don't know how much. Here's the catch. I'm a single woman who's never really done any DIY. I'm willing to learn, but I know nothing right now. Also, the house is located in a completely different state. I work remotely, so relocating isn't a problem, but I have no friends or family in the area. I would be starting over. I need some advice. Should I buy this house or keep looking? Okay, that's a big question, right? There's a lot to that one. A whole lot of layers to that one. A whole lot of layers. So we're going to take it apart, I guess. And I guess first I would say I can understand the pandemic shutdown must have been really hard for people in New York City. I was just there and I have was in a small space and I'm thinking if you couldn't go outside or have any wide open spaces available right. to you, that would be really, really hard. So let's take this piece by piece and let's take the relocation portion first, because you and I have both relocated to different places without ties, but I have a little different situation. So tell me about yours. Um, well, mine's, mine's happened twice now. This most recent time was moving from South Louisiana up here to, to St. Joseph, Missouri. We just fell in love with the area, fell in love with the community and, and the history. Granted, I was older at this point. So, I mean, I had a family, I had a child, so no family ties to the area, but we had made friends already here. Um, I'm definitely more comfortable in in what I can handle. And, you know, with technology nowadays, it's easy to keep in touch with family, regardless of, of how far away you are. Um, the first relocation was pretty much straight out of college. I mean, shortly, shortly after college, and I went from Florida to South Louisiana with zero ties to the area to no friends. I, I moved for work, working on the desk side of preservation, as I like to call it and wanted to, to make a statement to the community. So I bought a house that had been abandoned for 20 years and moved in, you know, Christmas Eve to a house that everyone thought was haunted because it had always been empty. And at that point, I was single in my early 20s and was somewhat handy, but not not where I am now. So that was a little bit harder. It, it helped for me because I'm an introvert. So I'm okay with not seeing people for days on end. But, uh, you know, if you're coming from a, a very populated area like New York City and you are an extrovert, you like that communication and camaraderie, I could see how that would be difficult. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you moved to St. Joe, Joseph. Sorry, I always call it St. Joe because, you know, from the area. But you moved to St. Joseph after a vacation, right? So you went on vacation, kind of liked it, and then eventually bought a house? Yeah, and we, we got a house before we ever moved up here. Um, we came up here. We We always... Kind of traveled the country on we would take random vacations to places that had a lot of history and we never went to the same place twice saint joseph kept popping up and you know these giant old houses kept popping up for sale for for next to nothing so finally it was like you know we've got to just go see what it what it's like up there um and we spent a week up here and didn't get to see half of the history because there's so much history in saint joseph in terms of Companies that were formed here, it was a jumping off point for 
the westward expansion and the gold rush. It was the last big settlement west of the Mississippi River. It was the start of the Pony Express Museum or the Pony Express. There's just so much that happened here that after a week we hadn't seen it all. So we came back, which we had never done before and ended up doing that two or three times and then met people. And once they found out what I did, then it became more of like a, hey, we're going on vacation. Let's go back up to St. Joe. Kind of went from there to, to moving up here full time. Yeah. Well, I have lived all over the United States and I've moved many places alone. I moved kind of back and forth, honestly. I moved from Missouri to Connecticut alone. I moved from Connecticut to Utah alone. I moved, then I got married. So Andy and I moved to, we moved all over. And recently we went from California to here in New York. And then eventually I'll be going back to Salt Lake City. So yes, I have been all over and there have been no ties to my family in any of those places after I left Missouri. Okay. So I had to make new friends and new connections every single place that I've, I've gone, which at first sounds hard, but as long as you're, I am an extrovert. So I have to, I, I'm sure you didn't know that. No, <laughs> never had a it's, clue. Huge mystery. Yeah. Anybody who meets me will have no idea that I'm an extrovert, <laughs> but it just depends. You know, if you move to a community where you don't know anybody, but you have a hobby, maybe you like to read books. So you join a book club or maybe you like to run and join a run club, which was the case with me. That's how I met most of my people that I enjoy. Or maybe you like volunteering in the, at the historical society or for Habitat for Humanity or whatever it is that you think you might like to do, that definitely does, even as an introvert, ease that burden of moving into a new community and not knowing anyone. And I would think, I mean, introverts, you need some time alone, but it's not like you don't ever need people. Right. No, I, I can survive for, for long periods without having interaction. But at the same time, uh, you can almost call introverts like a cat. They kind of, they'll, they'll, seek out attention or seek out that kind of camaraderie when they want it. And then when they're done, they want to just be able to retreat into a, into a dark corner. Um, I will say it, it made it easy m making the move to South Louisiana because whether you wanted to meet people or not, the South Louisiana culture, the New Orleans culture, if you've never been there, uh, you can't help but kind of be embraced. There's, you know, as soon as somebody new moves into an area, people are going to come. They're going to find out your history. They want to talk to you. They want to see what you do and what you're about. And it, it made it very easy to, to make new friends without really trying. So where you're, where you're moving to plays a big role in, in how easy of a transition it'll be. So maybe I would say it would be a good idea for this person to at least take maybe one vacation there and see what it's like. Definitely. Okay. We kind of handled the relocation piece. So the next thing I thought about was she's a single woman who doesn't know any DIY, but she's willing to learn. How do you feel about that one? I know how I feel about it as a, not a single woman, but as someone who learned DIY, go ahead. But you've been a single woman. I have never, I have never been in that position. Um, the, the not, not knowing anything DIY, but willing to learn. <laughs> I'm is, sorry. I just, I just got that. Yeah. You've never been a single woman. That is true. Go ahead. Sorry. I mean, um, um, the DIY part, I, I'd be perfectly okay with that. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'd say jump head first and then learn. That's the best way to learn is having to do it and not having any other options. When I moved to Louisiana, I, I was handy. I'd done stuff before, but nothing teaches you about old house maintenance better than working on an old house. Because if something breaks or if you want something done in that exact moment, you have to learn to do it yourself. You know, even if you're surrounded by skilled crash people, they're not going to be able to drop everything and be at your house the next day when something happens. So I would say if you're willing to learn and that doesn't scare you, then then you can dive right in and, and you'll learn kind of what tools you need right off the bat. And then you'll, you'll learn a little bit at a time. And I agree with that 100%. A willingness to learn is half the battle right there. And the kind of person who's willing to see it through and not get to, I mean, we all get frustrated, but I mean, willing to work through those frustrations and come out on the other side because things in an old house will always break. I mean, as soon as you put something back together, something else will break. <laughs> it's just the law of old houses. And that's part of the fun too, is you can improve things as your skills get better. What you might've done as a, as a fix, you know, when you first moved in, as you get more comfortable, as you get better, as you get, you know, better tools, better skills, you can go back and change that and you can improve it down the line. Exactly. Okay. So, so far you and I are in agreement. 
Now, the last piece of this puzzle is the size of the house. And she said that she found her dream house, that it's big, six bedrooms, two bathrooms, and it's on four acres. I have feelings about this. (laughs) What are your feelings about this as someone who owns two gigantic houses side by side? My feelings are that she should buy it right now. (laughs) I I am... The acreage is, is one thing because that's just the, as you expand in land, it sounds great. But I, both of my houses now are have about an acre, which is great in the, in the wintertime. It's beautiful. It's nothing but snow uh, in the summer. I mean, that's two acres that I'm cutting once a week, plus the weed eating, plus the gardening, plus the, so it's an added, an added labor, unless it's four acres of just kind of woodlands that you don't have to do anything. Size of the house, I love it. The bigger, the better. The one in Louisiana that I moved to, and I was single. It was it was right around four thousand square feet, which is big by normal standards. Not so much now because I've taken a further step into insanity with the current house. But you know, I, I was a single man, four thousand square feet. It was six bedrooms, four bathrooms, um, because they had enclosed a balcony and a porch. So that ended up being ripped back open, and you know, it ended up being I think four bedroom, three bath. But the nice thing about old houses and especially big houses is you don't have to live in the construction zone. Uh, if it's a big enough house, you can work on sections that can be completely torn apart and completely a mess. And you can still have your little safe, quiet space that, you know, restore your bedroom first. And that way you can always retreat into a finished area. The, the bigger the house, the more options you have for that. And I feel like if you jump into a tiny house, then you're kind of going to live in a mess for a while. I don't disagree. I don't, I'm not going to come right out and say no, but here's, it gives me pause and here is why. I will tell you the things that I would love for this person to consider before they jump on this particular house. It's all about this particular house. It's not about anything else moving. It's not about, it's just about this particular house. The thing is, so let's go with the four acres, like you said. So you get four acres and you're moving from a city. That means you're probably going to have to get a lawnmower. With four acres, you might have to get a riding mower, then you might have to get your weed trimmer, then you might have to learn how to prune your trees. And it just, it goes on and on. You were talking about added labor. So it's a giant piece of property for a single person who also is going to be working on the house. And then we get to the house and bigger houses have bigger roofs and bigger houses have bigger basements and bigger foundations, which can be really costly and labor intensive to fix over time. You know, for instance, there's a roof, there's a really beautiful house in my town and the roof replacement on that because it was super complicated was a $75,000 and that was over like 6 years ago. And that's a lot of money, a ton of money. So, I would be looking at things like the complications of the roof because that's probably something that maybe I would never DIY. I would never DIY my roof, not on a big old house like that. And that would be something you'd have to to consider in the price, roofing, foundation, all that kind of stuff. Then you go inside, and I would guess that this person who lives in a city, she probably has a hammer and a screwdriver and a few things, but maybe there's a lot of tools that she's going to need. And as the house projects grow, the tool list grows too. So I would just say it's worth considering that money and time. I mean, for instance, I'm not a single woman. I have monetary support from my husband. So I don't ever want to give the impression that I'm some single mother here living on my own in my house because that would be completely untrue, completely false. I have monetary support from my husband, but he does not live here right now. And so I have the sole responsibility as I have for the past eight years that we've lived here primarily for all of the tasks here, whether that's hiring someone or whether that's doing something. And it is hard. You know, you get burnout, you run out of money, and you kind of give up a portion of your life to do this. And again, I'm not saying that's wrong. If that's what this person really loves and dreams of and wants to do, then I say go for it. I'm just saying think about all these things, how you like to live your life, how much income you have, how much time, just just the, the big picture of a house this size. That's all I'm saying. Right. And, and I have to preface it too, I guess. When I picture New York City, I've, I've been there, I've seen the prices. So I know you can leave New York City and go darn near anywhere else in the country and live quite comfortably. 
neither of us know where this dream house is. We don't know if it's at the top of the person's budget or if it's just so cheap that it's hard to pass on. That's how we ended up with, with our second home here is we were given an opportunity that uh, it got to the point we couldn't pass it up. And now we, we ended up with the project, but definitely, if definitely have to be within your means. So you have to know what you can afford, what you can handle, kind of what unexpected expenses could jump out at you. Absolutely. I, I will agree with that part of it. And maybe again, just how you want to live your life in your off time and whether you're going to have off time with a house that size. So let's recap. You and I both think that relocating to a new area with no ties, no friends, totally fine, right? Absolutely. And then we both agree, I think, that as a single woman who doesn't know DIY, that is not a deal breaker. You can learn that. Everything's good. I agree. Yes. Okay. It's just the size of the house. That's where we disagree a little. You say go for it. And I say, maybe look at some other smaller houses. <laughs> I guess that's where I land on that. Look at other houses that, that could be your dream house too that are a little smaller. But again, this listener just asked our opinion and you're welcome to take that with a grain of salt. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. If you have an old house or DIY question that you would like for me and a guest to answer on an upcoming episode, please send me a direct message on Facebook or Instagram. Or visit truetalesfromoldhouses.com and submit your question via the contact form. And now it is my turn to ask you a question. This season, I want to know, regarding old house ownership, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? And here are a couple of your answers. Leanne says, I wish I knew then that the house will not crumble to pieces if I don't do a project immediately. And Caitlin wishes that she knew then that going slow and doing it right is always worth it. Now, when I read that answer, my first thought was that I think a lot of us are probably guilty of rushing through the first few old house projects, maybe because we're just so eager to get started and to have something to show for our effort. If you have an answer to this season's question and you'd like to leave a voicemail, head on over to truetalesfromoldhouses.com and click on the mic icon on the bottom right corner of the page. Follow the prompts from there. You may use your phone or your computer as long as it has a mic. You're also welcome to submit your answer on the contact page or send me a message through social media. And once again, this season's question is regarding old house ownership. What do you wish you knew then that you know now? Let me know. As I mentioned before, True Tales from Old Houses continues this season because of the generous support from our sponsors. So I'd like to pause for a moment and tell you more about them. Once again, we are supported by the window course from Scott Seidler of the Craftsman blog. The window course is a step-by-step, do-it-yourself window restoration program that will teach you everything you need to know to successfully restore your wood windows. The window course offers all of the start-to-finish instruction you need right now, and hands down, Scott is one of the best teachers in this business. I have learned so much from him over the years. One of the best things about buying the window course is that it's yours to keep. You own it. So if you're working on a window and you get stuck, you can just go back and review as many times as necessary. No more digging through YouTube or your computer bookmarks trying to find the tutorial you need. Owning the window course is like having Scott at your house whenever you need him. The content is self-paced, so you can go as fast or as slow as you need to, and there are several price points to fit your needs and budget. If you sign up for the Lifetime Access Package or Training Package, then you'll get a free infrared paint remover, which is a $130 value. The window course is offered with a money-back guarantee, and I have still got an active coupon code to share. Scott is offering True Tales from Old Houses listeners a discount. For 10% off, visit the window course and use the coupon code TRUETALES. True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Sutherland Wells maker of exceptional polymerized tongue oil finishes since 1965. All of the Sutherland Wells products are handcrafted in Providence, Rhode Island, with the highest quality sustainably grown tongue oil. Tongue oil native to China has been used for centuries as a durable finish for wood, metal, and stone. And unlike polyurethane, tongue oil finish penetrates so it flexes and contracts as conditions change, making it the perfect pre-finish or protectant for everything from fine furniture to window sash and sills. I've started adding Sutherland Wells products to my oil primer for added flexibility and penetration, and I am shocked at how smooth my top coat of paint looks now. Specifically for pre-coat, I use Clarabelle's, but Sutherland Wells has an entire product line for whatever you're working on right now. 
siding, hardwood floors, furniture restoration, cutting boards, you name it. To learn more about the complete product line, visit Sutherland Wells, that's W-E-L-L-E-S, SutherlandWells.com. And to save 10% on your first order, use the coupon code TRUETALES. True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Preservin, a unique preservation franchise opportunity developed by longtime window restoration pro, Ty McBride. The mission of Preservin is to save the future by preserving the past. So what exactly is Preservin? Well, what if you could go to work every day on your own terms while also doing something meaningful within your community? What if you could start a home service business without owning complicated and expensive tools that are difficult to transport to and from job sites? The team at Preservin will train and support you to operate a Preservin business in your community, equipping you with the tools you need to perform sustainable wood rot repairs and build your own team of epoxy techs. You'll receive the playbook for a proven preservation business, exclusive access to ever-resin epoxy products, business software, and all of the marketing, advertising, training, and technical support you need. Owning a Preservin franchise offers the perfect opportunity for work-life balance while serving your neighbors and community in a recession-proof industry. You'll get to work your own hours and spend the rest of your time in ways that are meaningful to you. To learn more about becoming part of the Preservin family and their mission, go to Preservin Franchise. That's P-R-E-S-E-R-V-A-N, PreservinFranchise.com slash TrueTales. My guest today is architectural historian, preservation consultant, and author Scott Hansen. When Scott couldn't find a complete resource for historic home restoration and rehabilitation, he decided to write one. The 720-page hardcover volume with more than 2,000 photos and drawings took four years to write, drawing on Scott's 40 years' experience in the historic preservation field. Hello, I'm Scott Hansen. I am an architectural historian, historic preservation consultant, and author of Restoring Your Historic House, The Comprehensive Guide for Homeowners. And uh, I'm joining you from my historic house here in Maine. Welcome, Scott. I'm so glad to have you here. Well, usually I go into these interviews and I know a little something or I've had some sort of personal contact in some way with my guest, even if it's through a friend of a friend or whatnot. And I realized when I sat down to come up with the questions that I wanted to ask you, I don't know you at all. (laughs) So we're going to have to get to know each other in this 30 minutes or so that we spend together. But I do want to say that I have your book. I refer to it and I love it. So thank you for writing it. Well, and if you know the book, then you do, in fact, know a bit about me, because much of the book is based in my 40 years experience in the preservation field and draws on work I've done on a whole number of projects through the years. Uh, So what else would you like to know? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, I would actually like to start by talking about your work experience, actually, and how that led you to write a book. Yeah, I mean, my uh, involvement with historic preservation actually started as an 11-year-old volunteer. I was going to see my grandfather, who worked at the post office in my hometown, and uh, next door to the post office was the abandoned Victorian Railroad Station, which had been a major uh, point of fascination for me throughout my childhood. It was just this fabulous building and passenger trains had stopped running before I was born. And so it had always been boarded up and more and more neglected through the years. And I noticed smoke coming from the chimney. And uh, so I went and walked around back where there was an open door and introduced myself to the man who was working there. Uh, who turned out to be Dwight A. Smith, who was the founder of the Conway Scenic Railroad in North Conway, New Hampshire. And I shortly thereafter began volunteering to help restore the buildings and equipment for the startup of the Conway Scenic Railroad. Wow. As an 11-year-old, huh? As an 11-year-old. So by the time I hit my teens, um, I already had experience with 
restoring steam locomotives, buildings, passenger cars, and uh, a number of other things. But it really was the discovery of architectural history when I was an art student at Pratt Institute in New York that sort of gave me a career path. And uh, it took a while to figure out how that worked for me. Uh, For a long time, I actually did work on buildings before becoming a consultant and ended up working in the planning department for the city of Portland, Maine, staffing the historic preservation program for the city, and then moving on to consulting from there. Along the way, I bought my own historic house in a historic district and became a member of the Historic District Commission and eventually the vice chair of that commission. And so I came at the field of preservation from a whole lot of different angles. And throughout the the decades that this played out, I kept waiting for someone to write a really comprehensive book on the topic for homeowners. Uh, because homeowners typically can't afford preservation professionals like me to help with rehabbing their historic house. At a certain point, it became clear that no one else was going to write it. So I did. You're correct. There are not a lot of books. I can't think of another book quite like yours. They've taken you know, segments. There's books about windows or there's books about woodwork or painting or whatnot. But I have never seen another book quite like yours. Yeah, well, at 700 plus pages, (laughs) you know. um, (laughs) Exactly. I actually had your book. It was sitting on my desk and I thought, well, since it's mostly audio, I'm not going to show. But if I hold mine up, you'll see all my little sticky tabs in all the pages where I have (laughs) referenced it and used it over the years. So you've been a designer, I guess, a carpenter, painter. What about your house? You said you bought your own historic house. Was it in quite a state that you brought it back to life? Or what was the situation there? It was in an interesting condition in that it was built originally in 1827 as a cave with a kitchen out. About 25 years later, it had a full second story and finished attic put on the main house as the family that owned it had their four children and expanded. And it remained the home of the Witten family for two generations, uh, from 1830 to 1945. And when Sarah Witten died just before her 96th birthday in 1941, she left the house to the town to become the public library. And for the next 60 years, that's the role it played. Fortunately, the library made very few major changes. They moved in, they lined the walls with bookcases. Over time, the house came to hold 20,000 books, bookcases right across the windows. They covered the floors with commercial carpeting, and basically they left it alone. So when I got it, it had never had a full bath. It had never had a modern kitchen, but it was very intact behind the bookcases and under the carpets. And that's what I saw when I walked in were these federal style moldings with only two coats of paint on them in 180 years. You know, I recognized the few things that had been changed, like the original cooking hearth that's behind me here had been removed after a chimney fire in the 19th century, obviously been restored. Uh, (laughs) So it, it was very intact but had never functioned as a modern home. Right. So I've got to ask, what did a house like that functioning in modern times mean to you? How how modern were we going? (laughs) It meant it needed a modern kitchen. It needed full bathrooms. It needed to be energy efficient and comfortable. And it needed to feel like a home and not a museum. Mm -hmm. And so finding that balance has been the the task. Right. I was just going to say that, that you use the exact words. I was going to say that is a fine balance between home and museum. Yeah. I wasn't, this wasn't on my list of things I wanted to ask you, but I am curious, how did you design a kitchen then? 
that looked like it belonged in the house, but also served modern needs. Well, of course, the original kitchen had an open fireplace for cooking, the one sitting behind me as restored. And in the middle of the 19th century, they switched to cooking on a a cast iron cook stove. And that was as modern as it ever got. And when they went to cooking on a cook stove, they took a portion of the original woodshed and created a modern kitchen for the late 19th century. By the time I got the house, the woodshed and the original carriage house were gone. And there was a little room tacked on in the 1960s where the woodshed had been. And so that was an obvious candidate for conversion to a modern kitchen, because I didn't want to take the original kitchen, which had its very unique character, and put modern cabinetry and appliances in it. So I put a kitchen in the 1960s edition, uh, which is also an example project in the book. The house that I'm in is a summer house. It was built as a summer house, and it was part of an estate. And we redid the kitchen. Uh, We had sort of a 40s, 50s, and 60s conglomerate of stuff (laughs) in the kitchen. And when that was all removed, there were no signs of a prior kitchen. So I remember thinking, okay, well, maybe it's just unfitted, right? I mean, that was during, it's my house was built 1885-ish. It could have been unfitted. Well, I recently found out maybe 18 months ago that as part of the estate, there was actually a kitchen on the property somewhere else. They didn't have a kitchen here. They just brought the food in. So there were three houses on the estates and somebody was cooking somewhere and then just bringing, bringing the food around. Not at all how I live my life right now, but it did <laughs> solve a mystery. <laughs> yes. And, and in, I should uh, clarify that when I talk about a modern kitchen, uh, I'm talking about modern appliances and running water. Also, elements that relate to the historic character of the house. So the new cabinetry is beadboard painted. The countertops are slate and the backsplash is slate. The china storage is in a a great big antique glass-doored cabinet so that the modern cabinetry was kept very minimal and contained. The refrigerator freezer went into a custom-built beadboard cabinet. Because it was a room built in the 1960s, it had sheet paneling on the walls and 12 by 12 acoustical tile staple up ceiling. So the ceiling got drywalled to resemble a plaster ceiling. The walls got covered with lining paper and painted to resemble plaster walls. So it functions as a modern kitchen with a gas range and a dishwasher. Uh, Oh, and the centerpiece is a seven and a half foot long architectural salvage antique slate sink with drain board. So it is a modern kitchen, but it has characteristics that relate it to the historic house that it's part of. Right. Doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah. And and the same approach was taken with bathrooms. You know, in 1827, there were no bathrooms. Um, There was an outhouse at the end of the woodshed. So my approach was to use materials and fixtures that felt like they could have been installed at the end of the 19th century or beginning of the 20th century. So they aren't as old as the house, but they still have an old character. Mm -hmm. The question everybody asks, are you done with your historic house? Are are you still working on it? (laughs) (laughs) No. Uh, In fact, uh, just 10 days ago, I uh, drove up to the White Mountains to look at a historic barn, trying to find a frame to disassemble and reuse to recreate the missing carriage house. And that 1960s room will come down and there will be a bigger modern kitchen between the house and the carriage house. That's phase two. (laughs) Did you go into it knowing there would be phase one, phase two, phase three? Yeah, it's actually chapter three of the book actually has the plans for both phases. Uh, I explain how, you know, to develop a phased plan and, and why sometimes that's 
the best approach to first deal with what you've got and then deal with your additions or expansion. And clearly, I haven't read this book from start to finish in a chronological order. I usually, I look through the sections that I need to know, and you can use it either way. I mean, it would read like a book, or you could also use it the way I've been doing it, which is tabbing it and <laughs> referring to it when I need it. Yeah. And I hear from lots of people who tell me they do exactly that. You know, the book is fully indexed. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so any particular topic you're interested in, you can quickly get right to the information you need. Yeah. And that's the absolute truth. I've, in fact, I've never thought, oh, I want to look up something in this book and it hasn't been there. Like there's always at least a little something to get you started. So I appreciate that. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about your book. In the age of blogs and video and social media, why did you want to write a book? Uh, well, I think to start with, because I'm a book person myself. You know, the library had 20,000 books here and I've only got three or 4,000 books here. <laughs> um, but books have always been where I go first for information. And the internet has definitely changed that to a large degree. But I think, you know, books are really important for some types of information. You know, I have Restoring Your Historic House, Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest accounts that I post to every day. And I try to provide something of interest and educational value every day, but I can't describe a phased rehabilitation plan in a social media post. It's just too involved. And so for subjects like rehabbing or restoring houses that are nuanced and layered and complicated, a traditional publication is still the best way to present that information. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And we'll put all your social handles and such and website and everything on the show notes. And we'll mention it at the end again before we, before we wrap. Uh, but what do you think makes your book different. I mean, we talked about the fact that it's comprehensive, but there are books, smaller books, single subject books here and there. What makes your book different? Uh, well, I think obviously the first thing is the fact that it is comprehensive. It's one stop for virtually anything you can think of related to the rehabilitation and restoration of historic houses. I think what sets it apart from some of the older books on the same topic, and you know, there were good books published in the 80s and uh, 90s. Uh, but at that time, publishing color photography was much more expensive. And so they tend not to have a lot of photos, and they tend to have even fewer color photos. And technology has changed. The tools and techniques and materials available, even for restoration, have evolved. You know, in the 1980s, no one was reattaching historic plaster to save it. And they figured out how to do it in the 90s. And now it is the standard, whenever possible, is to preserve historic plaster. So the book includes more up-to-date information than a lot of the older books do. I always think the epoxies have changed a lot, too. The yeah. products oh, that we absolutely. use to, to make repairs, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, for instance, now we actually have scientific studies that show a rehab historic window with a storm window is as efficient as a modern insulated glass window. You know, just those sort of factual bits of information weren't available when many of the books on the subject were written. Up to date information, I think, is definitely something new. Well, and we can say that information about Windows all day long, but unless we have that science backing it, sometimes it's a hard sell for people. So it's nice to have that available. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful book. Like we've, we've talked about 720 oh, pages, photographed. It's definitely not a project or doesn't seem like one that you started on a whim. <laughs> 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 How long did it take you to put this book together and get these? They're, the photos are all labeled. It's yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, 2,144 photos and drawings. 
Wow. Uh, each one captioned. Yes. <laughs> the book took four and a half years from the initial outline preparation when I was first talking to my publisher through the book being released. Uh, and about four years of that was writing. Uh, and then a half a year of actually getting it put together by the designer and printed. So it was a long process. Yeah. You must have felt like a million bucks when you had that first copy in your hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like at that point, it was just like, I hope someone wants it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how's that going for you? I think people want it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, it was interesting because before signing the contract, the publisher had me do research. What's out there? What's comparable? What's the market? You know, so we went through this process. So I felt pretty secure. There was a market for the book, but there was no way to be sure. So I started the so, uh, social media accounts uh, about six months before the book came out. And I thought, well, I can start to promote it and let people know it's coming. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll eventually get 5,000 followers. That would be really cool. Um, well, that happened really fast <laughs> and it became clear quickly that there really was an interest and market for this book. And, uh, you know, at this point I'm at, a, I think 115,000 some odd followers and, uh, the book has sold continuously for the two and a half years it's been out. It sells very well, both signed copies from my website, uh, as well as in bookstores and online. The book won an award for excellence overall. The design, the quality, the writing, it was quite an honor to win uh, an award for this book. So uh, you know, I think people have really appreciated that so much effort went in to getting all parts of it right. And my publisher, Tilbury House Publishing, deserves a, a huge amount of credit for the actual production end of it. They did a great job. Your award is well-deserved. Absolutely. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you this, too. I, I keep saying that. I I wanted to ask you this now that we've gotten started, but it's funny because when you don't know someone, you think, well, should I ask this question? Should I not? But I'm just going to go for it. The old house community, it's a pretty passionate bunch. And I'm wondering, do people ever read something in your book and say, oh, he got that wrong? Like, that's not the way it's done. Do you ever hear anything like that? Uh, interestingly, I expected to. And as the social media following has grown, you know, I'm in daily contact with many, many people who have an interest in this topic. You know, so when the book came out, I, I said, I'm going to put a copy aside and I'll put sticky notes in it for things people find that need to be corrected in the next edition. Um, there were no sticky notes in it <laughs> two and a half years later. And so no one is more surprised than me. Uh, and of course, now that I'm saying this, I'm going to get 85 people saying, well, you got that wrong. <laughs> but uh, And I appreciate that. I would like to correct anything that's wrong uh, in the next edition. But it's it's really been surprising to me that it seems I got a lot right. <laughs> I would believe it. I would absolutely believe it. So what are some non-negotiables for you on a more personal level, I guess, when it comes to historic rehabilitation? And I purposely didn't use the preservation word because that comes with its own set of standards from the Department of Interior. But I always think of re rehabilitation as having a little more wiggle room because old buildings have unique challenges. Yeah. And in fact, the Secretary of the Interior's standards are standards for rehabilitation. They acknowledge that for a building to continue to be useful, which is the key to survival, things have to change. You know, we don't live in museums. We, I love doing Thanksgiving dinner on the hearth behind me here. I don't want to do that every day. 
<laughs> right. You know, there's a reason someone had to be home all the time to keep the fires going. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so I think for me, and, and the book really goes into a lot of detail on this subject, the key is to start by understanding the house. What are its character defining features? And then prioritizing them. So what are its most important character defining features? And where is there room for change to put in modern systems and a modern kitchen and a bathroom and whatever else it is you need to function in a world where there isn't someone home to tend the fires all day, every day? And so it really, it depends on the house. Every house is going to have its own unique characteristics, and it it requires taking the time to understand what's there and what's missing that could come back potentially, like the fireplace behind me. So it, it's you asked a, a simple question that doesn't have a simple answer. That's okay. I I think to provide some general generalizations on the topic, I think intact historic features are important. And to the degree we can preserve them where they are, that should be a starting point. And if things have to be changed, then find the things that are less significant and try to focus your changes there. And remember that Historic houses were built at a time when things were intended to be repairable. That is a completely different approach to construction than what exists today, where things are maybe replaceable. That is a completely different way of framing construction. And having work done by people who understand repairability is essential. If you get your standard new construction carpenter, he's going to want to replace everything because that's all he knows how to do. (laughs) He he wasn't trained to do a Dutchman repair on wood trim or to replace a sash cord on a window. He's trained to rip it out and put in something new made of plastic. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, which is going to have to be replaced again in 25 years because it's exactly, junk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, I would love to get your book into the hands of someone who needs it uh, because, like I said, I reach for my copy so regularly and I'm grateful that it's available. Would you be willing to sign a copy and I will give it away to someone who's listening to the podcast? Sure. Absolutely. Oh, that's great. We'll talk about all those details when we stop recording. But thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. And thank you for everything you've done to help homeowners. Well, thank you, Stacey. It's been fun. Thank you for listening to True Tales from Old Houses. And thanks to my guests, John Rogers and Scott Hansen. You can enter to win a signed copy of Restoring Your Historic House, the Comprehensive Guide for Homeowners from now until October 14th. The entry form and rules are available on the True Tales from Old Houses website. To continue the conversation, join me on Facebook and Instagram at True Tales from Old Houses and Blake Hill House. And to learn more about everything we discussed in today's episode, visit truetalesfromoldhouses.com. Until next time. <laughs>